Very good. Folks, I have a confession to make. I have a real confession to make. In August, when I was planning a fall message series, I didn't have James in mind. In fact, I had the book of Romans in mind. And it was my heart to share with you the truths and the beauty listed in that letter which Paul wrote to the Roman Christians. But I realized in the month of August, kind of last second, that that book deserves so much more time and energy to spend with you, more than just eight weeks during the fall. And I had to make a last second decision to change our fall message series. And James was on my radar. And without really strategically placing any given passage on any given day, I just filled in the book of James from October to November. And I say that because I wish I was that good at strategically planning things that far in advance. But today's passage of Scripture, today's perspective from the book of James, touches on something really relevant in our society. The book of James and the passage we're about to read and hear from touches on something... I think that is a serious issue, not just in the society, but according to James, also in Christian churches. We're about to hear James' own perspective on something that has caused every single person pain and sorrow. And we're about to hear something that has caused every follower of Jesus to stumble in their spiritual journey. James is sharing with us today a perspective about taming our tongues and tempering our thoughts. According to James, the tongue is ultimately just a symbol of a deeper reality. It's a symbol of our great potential and capacity for evil towards other people. According to James, the tongue is a symbol, a symbol of a force of destruction that ruins our world of relationships. According to James, the tongue, just that little thing in your mouth, is a deceptively powerful agent of corruption. James thoroughly is convinced that it's a wild animal even. even. It's an untamable part of our human person. Do you think he's right? As we hear from God's word this morning, I want us all to ask, pastor included, do we have a problem taming our tongue and tempering our thoughts? That seems like a really relevant message, especially after an election week. <laughs> but hear with me now the Word of God. If you are reading along in your pew Bible, you can read along on page 1267 on chapter 3. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we, will teach, we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways, James says. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses, to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire, but by a small spark. Hmm. 
The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil, James says, among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man, James says, can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Whether the tongue, uh, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and get this, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. And here James wraps up the passage by asking us to temper our thoughts a bit. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, says James, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. Wow, James, tell us how you really feel, <laughs> right? For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom, James says, that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks and thanks be to God. Not exactly the most encouraging passage of Scripture, but it is Scripture. And according to our own confessions, this is our only rule for life and faith. Do you want to know who God is and what God asks of you? You do have to read and deal with difficult passages like this. And talking is really what's on the table for James right now, wasn't it? Talking gets us all into trouble. Maybe that's why he said simply, many of you shouldn't really desire to be teachers, because if you do, you're going to be judged a bit more strictly. You basically have more chances to put your foot in your mouth. <laughs> I do that on a weekly basis. And it's true. Pastors do get judged just a little bit more strictly than everybody else. I don't know why that is. Maybe James was referring to judgment among people. Maybe James is also talking about judgment from God. If we don't practice theological accuracy, we will be judged more strictly by our Creator. And that's James' perspective. And he also offers what are really creative illustrations to have us think about the words we say. One of those is a bit in the mouth of a horse. Now, I'm not going to act today like I know everything about equestrian theory, I've never really raised a horse, I've never groomed a horse, I've never maintained a horse, but I have ridden a horse a few times in my, lives, in my life, and one thing I've noticed is people talk about putting bits in the mouths of horses. And I've learned over the years that unruly and stiff horses need to be trained and treated a little bit differently than high personality or sweet and gentle horses. Riders, like myself, and horse owners, not like myself, need discernment on the if and how to put a bit in the mouth of a horse. Some bits are made out of specific types of metal 
that taste really nasty in the mouth of a horse. Other metals taste a bit more sweet. Some bits are a little more simple in how they're made. Others are more complex. Some are made to fit comfortably in the mouth of a horse, and some have some really warped design that aren't very humane and can do some serious damage to the mouth of a horse. James says, either way, if you put a bit in the mouth of a horse, it has the power to control that animal. Power to control. And the same thing, he says, is true with our mouths. What is in our mouths is going to control us. It's going to dictate how we live our lives. And our Savior Jesus, you know, he said something even more true. He said it's not just what's in your mouth, but the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. What's in your heart is going to come out of your mouth, and that's what makes you unclean. That is demonstrative of the sin in our lives. Do you agree with James and Jesus' perspective? James gives another creative illustration. He talks about a large ship. Maybe this kind of uh, you know, sailing vessel was in the mind of James when he was writing this down. Uh, but you can see ships are large. They can be. This one has huge masts, long flowing sails. But there in the bottom left hand corner of this blueprint, you see a tiny little rudder. And James says, even though it's just a small you know, part of the ship in proportion to the whole thing, it has the power to steer the entire ship, even against the fierce winds of the sea. And by the pilot's own steering of that rudder, the ship will go where it will go. Hmm. Some great examples that James has just given us. There's another example, too, that James gives, and that is a small spark can set a huge forest on fire. This is a picture of what is called Williams Fork Fire in Colorado. Some of you know that my wife and I went to Colorado uh, in October, and this fire almost disrupted our whole traveling plan. Had this fire made its way across I-70 eastbound, Shaley and I would have had to alter our plans to get back to the airport and cut us probably almost a day short of our travels. But it didn't. Firefighters aren't sure what caused this fire. Maybe it was a lightning bolt. Maybe it was beetles. I read something about uh, an article on National um, Nat Geo, right? They have this thing that beetles, they ha when they eat the wood, it causes so much friction and the, the, the trees start on fire. You know what James says? Our mouths and the words that we spit out are like sparks. And in the right context, it can send up a whole situation in flames, causing unnecessary and immense damage. Have you ever felt that kind of damage from someone's words? Like, at the right time, they said the wrong thing, and it just destroyed you. It wiped you clean out. Have you ever done the exact opposite? Have you said something that completely destroyed someone and wiped them clean out? James says it's a world of evil. This little thing that flaps between our jaws is a world of evil and it corrupts our whole person. There are all kinds of damage we can do from letting our tongues go if we don't tame them. You know, I was thinking about gossip being one, an example from the beloved show Andy Griffith, right? Andy Griffith is such a wholesome show. Why don't they make stuff like that anymore, right? There's this one episode where Barney is cleaning his gun, and Barney always has issues with his gun, doesn't he? 
So he's cleaning his gun and cuts his finger. And Andy Griffith, being the kind Andy Griffith that he is, says, You know what, Barney? I'll run across the street and grab you something to take care of that finger of yours. So Andy, you know, comes across the street into the drugstore. And he asks the drugstore owner for something to tend to Barney's finger. The drugstore owner gives him some sulfur power, and just as he's about to leave, Andy starts talking with some of the ladies of the town. And they overhear that Barney has a little cut on his finger. And then Andy goes on his way. And one of those ladies said, I think there's something more going on here. Something more that meets the eye. And the next scene flips to that very lady dialing her phone and talking with her friend. And she says, you know what? It started out with just a simple asking of something. And it turned into needing a miracle drug to heal Barney's finger. The next scene flashes to another lady. And she says, well, I hear that Barney cut his finger on his revolver, and he has a serious infection! And then it flashes to another scene, and that person says, I hear that Barney shot his gun, and it malfunctioned, and it ripped his arm clear off to his shoulder! And then it flashes to another scene, and that person says, did you hear the news? <gasps> Barney shot himself in the chest! And then it, you know, right back to the, the sheriff's station, and it's peace and quiet. Barney's cleaning his gun. He's got his finger taken care of. And in walks to the sheriff's station, Oliver Monroe, the town's funeral director. He marches up to Andy and says, My dear Andy, I am so sorry to hear about the passing of Barney. <laughs> and Andy says, What? Our mouths, our words, they set off sparks and they create forest fires. It just gets out of control so fast. But here are other ways that our tongues actually do damage. Outbursts of anger. Have you ever just had someone blow up at you? <laughs> and you're just like, whoa, what's that all about? And then in that outburst of anger, they throw daggers. <laughs> Have you ever cut someone down behind their back? Has someone ever torn you down face to face? Have you ever been overly and maybe unnecessarily critical of someone? You just lavish your criticism without really thinking about the long-term impact that has on a person. You know the old saying, sticks and stones break my bones, but words will never hurt. In James' view of the world, his own perspective, that's false. Sticks and stones break our bones, but words set our souls on fire. <laughs> What kind of practice do you use with your words? How about being two-faced? Yeah, I'll be one way with one person, and then when I'm with a different person, I'll be a different way. Has that ever happened to you? How about verbal abuse? Things that are like clinically verbally abusive. Think about all the ways that we tear people down and inflict damage into the world because of our words. How about telling a dirty joke? Just because you want to make, you know, friends with people at your high school or your co-workers. How about discouraging people from pursuing their dreams? Or telling them that they shouldn't because they're not good enough? Has that ever happened to you? How about betraying dreams? Or excuse me, betraying a confidence? Someone tells you something in secret, and the next thing, you're out there blabbing it to the wind for all people to hear. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever said something super insincere just so you could make someone happy? The list people could go on and on. 
how exactly are we taming our tongues? And the last example that James says, hey, can salt water and fresh water flow from the same spring? They can't come from the same source. This is just a, a NASA view, a satellite view, excuse me, of the sediment uh, plume, all of the stuff that flows out of the Mississippi and into the Gulf. Well, you can see there's, there's a clear distinction between what is fresh water and what is salt water. These things don't mix. When we use our words, James says, it's, it's awful that on Sundays we come and we lift up our praises to God, but by Monday afternoon, by Monday afternoon, we're cursing people. And he doesn't judge us. He, says, he doesn't say, you are going to lose your salvation or anything like that. He just says, my brothers, all of this not taming our tongue, it just shouldn't be. It just shouldn't be. So here's a solution that you can take into your week, wondering about how to use your words, maybe put up a little bit more of a filter. And it comes right from the book of James. James says in our closing passage, let me find the passage here a second. He says, we need to temper our thoughts. We need to discern between what is earthly wisdom and what is heavenly wisdom. If we find ourselves using words to boast about ourselves, if we find ourselves using words to deny maybe the truth, if we're using our words in that way, we're not operating in alignment with God's purposes. That kind of wisdom, he even says in verses 15 through 16, it's not coming down from heaven, but it's unspiritual, earthly, and even it's of the devil. It's of the devil, people. Be mindful. Use discernment. Don't use earthly wisdom, but seek and look for that heavenly wisdom. Wisdom that comes down from heaven is pure, and your words will follow suit. It's peace-loving. That kind of wisdom shaping our words will bring unity, not division. It's considerate, submissive, full of mercy. It's full of good fruit. It's impartial. These kinds of things ought to direct and ought to steer and ought to spark the kinds of conversations that we have. And as we all go into this week, I'm going to just offer a, a special prayer with you that God would direct our words in a way that comes from heavenly wisdom. Let's pray together. Holy God, we are unholy people. If we were to keep a transcript of all our conversations between this Sunday and the past Sunday, we might find things that are displeasing to you. Things that you're saddened by. Things that you're upset with, even. God, this shouldn't be so, just like James said. In the week ahead, help us to set aside the week behind and pursue you and your heavenly wisdom. Give us grace to have pure and wholesome conversations and help us to be more like Jesus. We pray this all in his name. Amen.